you came and sort of spoke in front of a big group of us and I remember sitting in the audience and you had some mock-ups of what it might look like and you had your sort of like go-to-market plan and all, all of this stuff that I didn't really like know that much about at the time but I was like wow this looks so exciting and for me at like that time in my life I was working really hard on writing my PhD thesis and I'd just come off the back of like four years of training on the British rowing team and I was just kind of kind of jaded by both of those things <laughs> it was it was kind of tiring doing both both of those at that level and it was like hearing you guys speak like sort of switch something on inside of me and I was like wow yeah I've got some energy back to go out and like do this Brianna, good to have you in the program. Thanks for having me as ever, Jeff. It's good to good to see you back from your trip. Yeah, context there is I just came back from a trip to China, sightseeing and visiting my grandfather, who's 94. So Good longevity genes. Yes, I got some good genes there. But this will be a special episode talking about the story of Dr. Brianna Stubbs and her work and tenure at HVMN. So one of the bittersweet sweet news that we're announcing on this podcast today is that Brianna is transitioning from her head of research role at HVMN to a part-time subject matter expert research advisor role with us and has a new beginning back in the world of academia at the Buck Institute. So we'll talk a lot about that. Um, but before talking about the future, let's talk about the last couple of years of working closely together. I mean, it's, it's a bittersweet announcement. Um, and maybe to add some words before talking about the history, one of the most proud things that I have personally really care about and what we talk a lot about at HVMN is that our team is world-class and we're excited about working with the best people in their role. And one thing that I found that you represent and you really epitomize is that you're truly world-class at what you do. Um, I've told you privately that there's just, you're probably one of the top handful of people that understands ketones, exogenous ketones and human physiology. They're just like a, literally people that I could, we could count on our hands within less than 10 people that have done the studies personally, looked at the data on humans with all the different types of ketone compounds. So from that aspect, top tier, world class in terms of academic knowledge and understanding of the physiology, but also just your previous career as a world champion rower. I mean, so I think you get the double stack of being world class from an academic perspective and a world class from an athletic perspective. I think that's a very rare combo. So it's yeah. really been an honor and a privilege to work with you over the no, last couple I mean, years. Likewise, I think for me, the, to be able to reflect back on the two years taking Delta G ketone ester from being like this liquid that we just kept in a little like plastic bottle and sort of syringed out and did all of those experiments to seeing now like all of these beautiful bottles of human ketone that are being shipped all over the world and being used by people to break records and, um, you know, compete in elite sporting events and all of, or, you know, hearing all of the customer feedback and having been part of like making that a reality has been, and I'm sure it will like always be one of the absolute biggest achievements of my life. Um, and, you know, something that I'll always be really proud of. And it just, um, it sort of, for me, I just want to be able to get more into the detail of like how this is working. I'm so passionate about making discoveries and advancing the field and then communicating those discoveries that for me, I just want to be able to get like super hands-on and dirty and like grow the world of exogenous ketones because I think there's so much potential to help people there. And, um, you know, I've got this fantastic opportunity to go and work with two of the scientists that really, I think that they were the first people to ever publish on BHB being an HDAC inhibitor. So ketone body BHB actually affecting gene expression and so the the two scientists I'll be working with, John Newman and Eric Verdun, they really um, understand not just how ketones are used as a fuel, but as a signal as well. And so for me, I think that's like the next frontier in our understanding. Um, and we recently did a research roundup about BHB and inflammation. And there's all of these things that we're kind of speculating about um, what might ketone has to be good for. And now I'm going to be like back at the coal face, just really like trying to understand that. So I'm really excited about that. But as you say, it's like really, really bittersweet because before I joined here, I'd never really been as other than obviously being an athlete, but I'd been in the lab and never really exposed to what it takes to make something that's just a concept and um or you know a research chemical and like what would it take to to ship that out to thousands and thousands of people and everyone here at HVMN has like an absolute you know world class like attitude to productization and and actually like making 
a, a business around helping people live better lives. So I've learned so much from from you and from Michael about strategy and fundraising and all of the things that go into like, you know, putting, keeping the lights on and then Chrissy, um, what does it take to ship something and put it in a bottle and, you know, Zill and Paul and everyone who works on content and writing our blog posts, making the podcast. So, I mean, there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes here that go into, you know, I think one of the things that's most inspiring is how much everyone here like cares about the customers and making making better humans. Like that's that's a mission above the door, but everyone here really lives that. And so um, it certainly uh, was not like an easy decision for me, like personally, because of how I feel about the team here. But uh, I think that long term, I would love to to be sort of continue to be build myself as a world expert in this field, and this is like a fantastic opportunity to do that. So. Yeah, as you said, going to be staying on and as an advisor and still, um, you know, part of the family. So I think it is, a, you know, a, a transition, but it's not going to be a farewell or at the end of you being part well, of the family. It's a farewell rather than a goodbye. It's kind of like a exactly. until, until next time. And hopefully next time or in the next, in, in very shortly, it'll be a professor, Rihanna Stubbs as well. Fingers crossed, <laughs> yeah. We're super supportive and, and, and really excited for you to be able to double down into the basic science research, right? And I think that's where us as a products company, we're just not going to be fully fitted out to enable that kind of level of basic science research and understanding, which is just going to be much more of a natural fit at a research institution. So we're excited and, and support you there. Thank you. So I think it'd be fun to, yeah, to just reminisce on some of the highlights. I remember the first time I met you was probably close to two and a half almost three years ago at Oxford. And this was me meeting your thesis advisor, Professor Karen Clark over at Oxford and getting the first initial introduction and in, in, in tutoring session essentially about ketone esters. And she invited you who uh, was, well, you know, I, I, you guys, one of, you know, one of her star PhD students at the time to run through your, your thesis work at the time and then also you know, do a bit of a tour around Oxford campus. It was very much like visiting Harry Potter for me. Um, I had just gone to Europe. Uh, it was over at Oktoberfest before coming back home to the United States and, and made a, 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 a layover essentially over at Oxford and then getting dropped in the Oxford campus for the first time, which is a very idyllic, beautiful Harry Potter esque sort of campus. And then meeting and talking science with a bunch of British smart sounding. <laughs> ladies, um, <laughs> and then getting a tour of the different castles, essentially. I think it's funny because at that time, um, Professor Clark had been sort of like thinking about commercializing the Delta G keto nester for a long time. And so, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't my first rodeo. It wasn't my first tour that I'd given for <laughs> entrepreneurs and, and people who were interested in being business partners coming through. And I think it says a lot for what uh, Professor Clark saw in, in you um, at that meeting that she decided that um, you were the right people to like take all of those years of research and sort of make it a product. So I remember that meeting and I remember at that time I was coming towards the end of my PhD and had like half a mind on what, what would I be doing afterwards not really like all of that much um, but I remember when we sort of um, said goodbye I was like you know if this ever goes anywhere you, you know where to find me like I would be really really interested in helping with the like the launch here or what you know I'm not sure how we could work together but let's see what happens and um, then you know a few months later you were back in touch with her and coming over to visit and it was all kind of really taking off so it was just a really cool example of being in the right place at the right time for me anyways and and also for you reaching out to her and like um you know making the agreement there yeah a lot of things stacked and lined up really nicely for the group from the research and the regulatory coming online us as a startup and as a business really coming to maturity and then you from a timing perspective in terms of becoming a freshly minted PhD and looking for your next opportunity. A lot of these things was luck, but I think it goes back to like something that I've come to realize a lot over the last four or five years of running Atrium Man, but also just my, my, my full career just been in startups and building businesses for my entire career. Just a lot of things 
require a lot of luck. There's a lot of smart people, a lot of energy, but also requires a lot of luck in terms of all these things coming together at the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think what we have here at Human is like there's a lot of vision. Uh, and I think when you came with Michael to speak at the lab meeting, so sort of fast forward a couple of months on yeah. from us meeting initially, Jeff and Michael came to visit Oxford again. And I don't know whether that was when you were kind of finalizing things with Professor Clark, but you spoke at a meeting with all of the people who are researching ketones and researching cardiac metabolism. So you came and sort of spoke in front of a big group of us. And I remember sitting in the audience and you had some mock-ups of what it might look like. And you had your sort of like go-to-market plan and all, all of this stuff that I didn't really like know that much about at the time. But I was like, wow, this looks so exciting. And for me, at like that time in my life, I was working really hard on writing my PhD thesis. And I'd just come off the back of like four years of training on the British rowing team. And I was just kind of kind of jaded by both of those things. <laughs> it was it was kind of tiring doing both both of those at that level and it was like hearing you guys speak like sort of switch something on inside of me and I was like wow yeah I've got some energy back to go out and like do this by that point I was like oh PhD oh oh rowing oh you know like I wasn't <laughs> feeling like super energetic for those things and then you came and you spoke and I saw what like a bottle of human ketone might look like it wasn't actually anything like it ended up looking like but seeing it be a thing it was just so energizing uh, and you know for me joining the team and you know after after that presentation we connected over dinner and you invited me out to San Francisco and then eventually ended up moving here but it was just so um there was just so much work to be done and so much opportunity and so many unknowns yeah. that it was really cool to come out here and then sort of set about like addressing all of the things that needed to happen that I could help with that were needed to sort of make it a reality you know yeah. whether that was I mean one of the first things I worked on was I remember that you had um, at that time we were working really closely with Dr. Manny Lam who yeah. was writing a lot of the kind of oh this is what we're going to say about ketones this is how ketones work or yeah. try. We, we've been through so many iterations of how we ex what's the elevator pitch of how you explain like how ketones work and so one of the first projects that I worked on was just like what were the words that we were going to use to explain like the backgrounds of the basic biology. Yeah. And so a, a big project I worked on was like putting a lot of the knowledge that I'd written up in my thesis into some big kind of like educational guides that were the forerunner to our like blog content now. So it's it was like the very, very first iteration of now what is something where, you know, thousands and thousands of people click on a month yeah. to like learn about ketosis. And, you know, we, we were then, you know, alongside that kind of project, you and I went to like a load of meetings with sports teams and journalists and we had so much like education to do and this was before we even had the product product we were sort of talking to people and we would go and yeah. Jeff Jeff would talk business and then every now and again I would chip in with something <laughs> smart about the science and and we'd have our little bottles of ketone and at that time they were not um they were not as they look now they would kind of like um, a little bit OG. Yeah, you know, they're like, like home basically bottled. hand, hand, art, hand artisan crafted yeah. bottles of and we had We only had like 20 of them in the world. Yeah. You know, at any one time we had very few and we'd go to the meeting and we'd give it to, we'd sort of do our little spiel, give it to people and then do the finger stick reading. Yeah. And that's always been the, one of the things that's most compelling about this technology is that people can actually measure it working. It doesn't have to be oh, you know, do you feel like it's working? Like there and then in a meeting, we could demonstrate to people that it was actually like really profoundly shifting metabolism. And so, you know, like it, it only, we only had issues with their ketone meter reading like one time in the whole, like one time we gave someone ketone ester and their ketones didn't go up as much as we thought. It was, it still went up, but it wasn't as impressive as it normally was. But no, I think I it's the say, same. And it's like the, the ketone <laughs> meter totally fucked up. That yeah. was totally just like, it like didn't move. It was like so embarrassing. There were, yeah, that was really <laughs> embarrassing. That was one of our f worst meetings. So I think also at that meeting, I feel like I bought the ketone meter, but we owned, didn't have enough ketone strips. And we were like, You're, five, yeah, you literally we, we were five blocks away and you were like, yeah, you have to go back and get ketone strips. And so I, in the, you're entertaining these two people we were meeting uh, yeah. and I jogged back and then I got back and I was sweating and like dripping on the people as I tried, was trying to <laughs> finger prick them. That was a bit embarrassing. And then the ketone levels didn't go up and we got out of that meeting and we're like, wow. That, that work. Well, let's just <laughs> let's let's tee that one up to experience. Yeah, we won't we, we won't start over the meter, but that experience really turned me off on that specific brand of the, of yeah. the ketone meter. Well, it seemed like it would um, sort of somewhat tether the reading based on like what the previous reading had been. And I've seen this like with a breath acetone meter that I'd used one time. If you used it and then that used it again and then used it 
like took another reading directly after the second use, the the second reading would be kind of like more. So it was almost like it needed to like fully re- uh, clear. Yeah, I don't know. There was something, but it, I'm not sure that that could happen with a blood reader. But I mean, it definitely was completely like changed. But uh, yeah, I, regardless, I think I've just seen. I've seen uh, that there's some unreliability there. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. But um, most of the time we would go to these meetings and the keto nester would perform beautifully and the keto meters would perform beautifully. And it was this great, we were able to sort of really um, give people the background and then show them how it worked. And it was always funny, the different reactions we'd get when people would taste it. Because at that time, again, I feel like it probably wasn't, you know, the yeah. quite the finished product uh, wasn't tasting as good as it as good slash not bad as it is yeah. now. Um, so those were all like very, very interesting kind of meetings. And it was somewhat, you know, I remember the weekend before we went live and launched, I spent a lot of time in the office with the design team and the engineering team, Paul and Mike Lee, working on like the website copy. And we were working on like what graphs we were going to use. And I remember like it, there was quite a lot of complexity on the homepage at that time because we really wanted to be able to explain it. We could, and now it's interesting to see how we've kind of had to par things right back and try and make the message super simple so that people can don't aren't kind of overwhelmed by information so it's been it's been interesting to see to yeah, see definitely that. a learning experience for me because i think i'm cut from more of a similar cloth to you like i like the science like the data it's like okay let's explain this stuff and then you sort of see that like okay uh from a product perspective and a education perspective sometimes it's like uh, too much information and it's like, yeah. like how do you explain something that is very very deep biochemistry a novel physiological state we're inducing in people but even that, what I just said, sounds pretty complicated and maybe scary for for like a lot of listen. Maybe I think our listeners understand, but like general population might think that okay, what is this guy talking about? Yeah, and that's been, and I think will continue to be a challenge of the keto ketone space mm-hmm. broadly because one, there is interesting effects of why ketogenic diets, ketones, ketosis is interesting, but you don't want to fall into one side of the equation, which is like, it is magic Jesus juice that's going to solve all your problems <laughs> fight off your body. Yeah, But it's also like, not like it doesn't work. Yeah. It's just like, okay, how do we get the right level of the coolness and the amazingness of the technology without going too far on either side of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I think you also like touch on an interesting problem there, which is that there are so many, and this is what I'm hopefully going to be able to unblock more in the future by being involved in the research. There's all of these different use cases um, that have still got to be like fully proven out. And so I think that, you know, the inflammation is a really interesting case to study because we had all of this animal data suggesting one thing and now the very first human studies are starting and the results aren't like kind of marrying up. But it's like, we actually have to um, take that theoretical stuff or early animal evidence and start to translate it through into humans before because we one thing that I'm really proud of is that we've always um only told people we know keto nester does like specific things where we already have the evidence Mm -hmm. so you know we talk about performance and we talk about some of the recovery aspects and some of the cognitive aspects as soon as there's data i feel like we we're happy to sort of say yeah you can use keto nester for for athletic performance with carbohydrate you know like under these specific use cases but all of the other stuff we i think we're like pretty um open about it being a bit more like speculative at this stage Mm -hmm. um so i think that that's something that excites me to be able to like unpick and like further open up avenues for people who work on exogenous ketones to be like, actually, hey, like we really know that it works for metabolic syndrome or we really know that it works for Alzheimer's or TBI. But, you know, we're still um, early stage there and, yep. you know, want to be, be able to be part of unblocking like all of the people who are wait, actually waiting for the evidence before they just start like yeah, making I think all these promises. a lot of credit to you as our, our research lead helping really re- define the evidence grading and the standards in which we make claims. And I think that's been one of our strongest assets as yeah. a brand. And I think that's why a lot of people do trust us because we are direct with the science and the evidence. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I do want to come back to some of the funny anecdotes in terms of our favorite trips or experiments that we've done with with uh, VIPs or with different teams or investors. I remember some of our trips where we visited some, you know, this this woman, relatively high profile um, in, in, in the media world. Uh, and 
it was interesting when we gave her the ketone ester test that she her initial blood sugar was kind of high. She was like basically pre diabetic, diabetic mm. looking blood sugar. I think that that was like kind of some of the interesting experiences where, and it kind of and uh, put a light bulb in my head where there's a lot. We we hear the top level number of a lot of people have pre diabetes or metabolic syndrome in the world, or in, especially in the United States. And you actually go out and test people's blood levels. And there are definitely those people. And that people are, that have high elevated blood sugar and they don't really un- realize it. Yeah. I think and um, that's kind of on a low light. But I think some of the sports stuff was really fun in the, in the beginning where we'd have people that are celebrity athletes that were just like stabbing in, 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 in the finger. Yeah. Do you have any favorite anecdotes there in terms of either like interesting from a medical you know, we're not trying to make a medical diagnosis ad hoc on a ketone ester demo, but from that, it was interesting from a kind of general awareness of the preval- prevalence of metabolic syndrome or, 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 or high blood sugar to like just being able to interact and, and, and work with celebrity athletes. Any any highlights for you? I think definitely working with Victoria Busi on the world record attempt was kind of like especially having been an elite athlete, I really felt the sense that, you know, we had a responsibility to her to, you know, to get it right and to not, certainly not be doing, like at the very, the very minimum, not do anything that would, could possibly compromise like all of the training that she'd put on. And like at the very best case, like let's work out how to like support her so that she can get that extra like tiny percent that she needs to break the world record. So I felt like, um, like empathy with her and like kind of responsibility to make sure that we kind of tested it thoroughly. And she and I were in touch quite a bit. And, you know, by WhatsApp and she was, would tell me some of the numbers from the training sessions that she'd been doing. And, you know, one of the highlights there was when um, she'd been training with the ketone ester and then she was like, you know, I got to like train without it a couple of times because I want to see just kind of reset and see what that feels like. And she did a session and she came back to me and she was like, yeah, I totally want to use it because I did this session and like it was just wasn't the same. And I felt like I get so much better like focus and energy and performance with the ketone ester. And so for me, like especially as a sort of skeptical scientist, I feel like I want to like stay in that state of being kind of skeptical. I still feel this huge yeah, don't buzz. Don't sip the Kool-Aid too much. Right? Yeah, I still feel this huge buzz when someone tells me they think it works yeah. for them just because, yeah, I mean, I feel kind of personally like proud proud of that so when she when she came back with that kind of feedback and then um ultimately went to like went on to break the record I was very like pleased and proud to see something that we'd worked on sort of like translate and um yeah really pleased to have been involved in that attempt I think when we see these world record these amazing achievements it's like that took months, years of training to get there. Yeah, I mean, she was busting her butt for months ahead of that attempt. And I think we all just think, okay, like you just spend 60 minutes on a bike and you're done. No, that, that's a culmination of hours and hours over weeks and months of yeah. sacrifice to get to that stage. Yeah, I think that's kind of like life though. I feel like, especially with today's like attitude to social media, you kind of see edited highlights of everyone's yeah. lives. The firstly that may or may not be like true representation of what it's like, but also it's like it, you you don't necessarily understand like the grind that goes in day to day to making human ketone or to being like an elite cyclist or an elite rower or, or an elite even an elite scientist. Like all of the hours of frustration, you know, like trying to get something to work in the lab or all of the hours reading papers. There's like a lot of like non glamour in every single job that we don't that you don't see when you kind of see the end result. So yeah. I think that um, you know, personally I've always I've never been afraid of like the grind. Um and I think that that's like, you know, if there's something that we can kind of share here, it's like, yeah, it wasn't and it was a grind and we were spent a lot of time like kind of in the tr- in the trenches together, like working on like making human ketone a thing. And yeah. but everyone who we've worked with is kind of like in their own grind. Like Vittorio was in her own grind. Like you know, all of the cycling teams that we're working with, the training and stuff is a grind, and then all the, the military, all of those kind of things. Everyone's like working really hard day after day to like build the best versions of themselves that they can. And it's, you know, it's not an insignificant amount yeah, of work. Yeah, 100%. I, I mean, when you brought up like the grind, I was like me even making this, this product here. I just remember that the first time that we were importing 
uh, the ketone ester. It was like no one, knew, there's never emperor. No one knew before. what it was, and even things like how are we going to do the food label? Like all of these things had never been done before. Yeah. And you know, I remember there was a point where we were talking to the FDA, uh, or Chrissy was talking to the FDA, the Royal We. Chrissy was talking to the FDA, and it looked like it could even be classified as a carbohydrate because it wasn't fat and it wasn't protein. But we're like, but it's not a carbohydrate. Yeah. It's just not. You know, like yeah. how are we how are we going to reconcile this? So there were so many things that um that had never been done before that we really had to like do for the very first time um, that weren't easy. And I mean, I remember when in that like weird transitional period, so we launched for, I joined the company in May. And I remember when I met you and Michael in Oxford, you'd been like, we need you as soon as we can. We're going to be launching in like June, July, like go, go, go. <laughs> yeah. So I quickly uprooted my life and moved over here. And then it was like, oh, we're going to make it. Mm, we're gonna make it. Like, there was just this, it was so many things that we had to work through. It was like a lot slower and more, um, there's so many more obstacles to overcome than perhaps we could have ever imagined before we yes, started. Yeah, the delays of the manufacturing. Yeah, and, and then, so then we get to like... I remember we went on summer retreat and we were like, okay, we're drawing a line in the sand. We're, you know, no matter what, we're launching for like pre-sales yeah. on the 1st of November. And so we were all building up towards that point. We, when we launched for pre-sales, we still weren't at the point where we were able to fulfill. Yeah. Um, but by that point, we were kind of out in the public and talking to people about it. And then there was this horrible, like really, really difficult few months where we people were like, let's try it. And we still don't have it to give to them. You know, that, that was the worst. That was that was the most one of the most difficult times. Just every like every week or every other week being like, When's, when are we gonna have it? When are we gonna have it? When are we gonna have it? Like all of these people knew about it and wanted to try it, and we had to like lot, slow like, roll. I think people. this is public now, but like a lot of cycling teams were ramping up for the Tour de France, and at we that had time. very limited amounts, and yeah. we were sort of sending it over whatever we had over to them. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have very much of it at that time because yeah. we were still like doing very small like pilot batch. We weren't like at full scale production. Yeah. And then I remember when the very first like batch arrived at headquarters, and there's this picture of me uh, like I made like a chair out. We had I don't know like boxes, twenty right? boxes, and yeah. I'm in the little storeroom like sitting on it. And we <laughs> finally have human ketone. And then that day, Chrissy and I went and hand delivered to for the cycling teams yeah. boxes that were going out to um, to Europe for the for the like. Like grand tour racing yeah. season so I mean it was just like there was this period of time where we were doing everything by hand everything was coming to headquarters and we were doing it by hand and we didn't have very much of it and now like it's so much more mature and everything kind of goes out from the warehouse we, we don't have to send out anything yeah. ourselves anymore <laughs> but you know we, we have it and there's no like angst about oh we only have 10 bottles of ketone in the world can we really give like five to this celebrity that we're trying to schmooze or something like yeah, that yeah definitely some crazy highlights and some crazy grind stories right like yeah the initial batches were like hand sent yeah by your hands and Chrissy's hands yeah. I mean that's like some VIP service there you know and we actually used it with one of the football teams when it was just raw Delta G they were so desperate to get their hands on it they were like can you get get some of us and we were like well to supply you, this team you, I can I can like you know de deliver some of this to them yeah I mean you basically hand deliver it which probably limits a geographic location of what these teams could be but yes I remember that uh I remember that day. It was like little... our first check from an NFL team, which is kind of cool, yeah. which I have a picture of. One of the questions that um, producer Zill wanted me to ask, and I think is a good question, was from a, you know, coming from the academic world, what impressed you about HVMN that you wanted to join in and in, in, in be a part of a startup? And what was the initial, and this is me expanding on that, you know, what were your thoughts coming into Silicon Valley, San Francisco, the world of startups? Yeah. Was it what you expected over in Oxford? Um, what I have, think, it, obviously, reality is different from fiction. Yeah. What were the biggest differences there? What have you learned? I think that my expectation was that it would be, I don't know, I feel like it was much more like glamorized in my head as to like what it would be. I mean, it was it was literally like half the world away. And, you know, it seemed like a place that was kind of really, really flush with money and really, really you know, it just seemed like very... Um, glamorous I think is the right word and but I mean like and, and glamorous and fast paced and like certainly there is like elements that are glamorous but there's like as many elements that are like not as glamorous and I think the kind of the idea that a startup is a wash with money is like completely false I think startups actually have to be like super super scrappy and that's one of the things that was most impressive out here like how much you can do with the resources that you have you know really like maximizing everything that that kind of comes in and out of the in the company so I think that was like initially especially given you know 
I don't know, you you flew me out here and I was like, oh, I'm like I'm traveling on business for the first time, you know, so it seems like it's going to be much more like glamorous than academia. And in reality, there's that same kind of like grind and scrappiness. There is like access to, to capital and all of that that you don't have when you're an academic, acad- when you're in academia or when you're an academic. Um, so I think, you know, that was something where I think the reality and the the reality and my expectation were like maybe a little bit misaligned. But I think that I expected <laughs> that things would happen quicker than academia. And that has definitely been the case. You can actually, um, you're because you're not beholden to like a funding body or anything in the same way, you can actually execute pretty quickly. And I think a startup, especially when you're, you know, you can talk directly to every single member of the team. You know, everyone's like kind of over overstretched or stretched at the very least in terms of like what they're working on but um you can work like very closely and cohesively and make decisions and progress a lot quicker than in academia or in a big business so I think that that was something that was like really really refreshing and um that I kind of had hoped would be the case and and was the case I think one thing that I I expected that was you know there but also like not there is like um we we have like a very we had like a high amount of biohacking like ethos within the company and so i think that you know seeing that from the outside um, you know, you came the first time you were wearing a CGM and you just finished a seven day fast. And it was, that's actually, this is a funny story. So Jeff and Michael had just finished a seven day fast and I went for dinner with them and we had, and then we had one dinner and I was like, this is great. And then they were like, we need more food. And we went to two more restaurants. So we started off with like tapas, but I mean, I guess like on retrospect, tapas would not like really fill the hole after a seven day fast. And then I can't, then maybe we got like some kind of like curry and yeah. then we finished off with a pizza. So it got progressively like more junk food. We went to three restaurants that night. So, yeah. but anyway, you, you guys were like embodied like a lot of biohacking. But I think it's like also um, that, you know, coming and working with everyone, it's like, yeah, everyone's really interested in optimizing their health, but nobody's like a, a drone or a droid or a robot. Everyone's also kind of got that human side where, yeah, you need to like have an ice cream sometimes, or it's not like, you know, there's like definitely a human element to that kind of like rigorous like biohacking as well. And I think, you know, so that was something that, I didn't know whether if I worked here that I'd be like forced to fast 36 hours, like <laughs> twice a week, or whether I'd be like, you know, I don't know, doing all some kind of weird self experiments or, you know, whether two years later I'd have had like some kind of weird like implant, but now I'm still like firmly a hundred percent human and, um, it's hundred percent HVMN human and all of that jazz. You were pretty extreme on the Ironman and, and endurance it's triathlon. Kind of biohacking. So it's pretty aggressive in terms of, you know, you, you know what you're doing on, on, on the side as well, right? Yeah. Like you, either, I would say that doing an Ironman, you know, 70.3, that's like as hardcore as like a long extended fast, if not more hardcore. Yeah, I think it's going to be, I'm, I'm training for the first, my first full Ironman, which will be in July. So um, I'll keep you guys posted with how that goes. I'll be definitely using HVMN ketone for that race, probably more than one, probably more than one serving. Yeah, 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 we have, we'll give, you a, we'll oh, give you have, a special stack. I have some, yeah. <laughs> Hey listeners, if you're enjoying this episode thus far, please consider writing a review on our iTunes page. It really does help increase the visibility of our podcast. That's really the best way to support our work. In appreciation for your review, we'll hook you up with $15 of HVMN store credit. We also love it when we see you guys share our episodes that you've enjoyed on your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we often reshare those posts. Just tag us at our handle at HVMN. Now back to the show. I'm just like thinking about some of the cool trips that we had. I remember when we were initially launching uh, HVMN Keto and we did a trip out to New York and D.C. And I think this was your first time in New York and D.C. because yeah. we had a lot of reporters out there that we were supposed to brief. Yeah. And I mean, and, I think uh, it was the first time, as you said, it was as I'd only been to America one time before I came to visit here in San Francisco. So when my time here at the company, pretty much everywhere that I visited, it's been like the first time that I've been in that place in America. So I'm like first trip to L.A., first trip to New York, first trip to D.C. And then we've also been off in like some of the military bases and like slightly more like obscure places as well. But You know, as as a British person who grew up watching Friends on TV, to go to New York and sort of see see it like in the flesh was really awesome. And I think, you know, I feel like perhaps Americans like kind of take that for granted, but it's very iconic. And, um, you know, and 
even things like here in San Francisco, like the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a super iconic landmark. Now I bike ride over that like two or three times a week. And, but it still like has that kind of like, um, it still has a big impact on me when I do that. I still feel like I'm super lucky to be able to live in like a beautiful place like this. But it was it was like that to go to New York and be like, wow, I'm actually like here on like Ground Zero at the World Trade Center or, yeah. you know, like here it's like the real yellow like taxi cabs and oh, I'm in a real New York traffic jam. You know, like, <laughs> that can even be exciting the first time that you do it. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, we were late somewhere, weren't we? Because we decided to take a cab and then the journalist got upset with us because yeah. he told us to take the, the subway. Yeah, he got upset with us because we were late because we took a cab and got stuck in one of the tunnels. Yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> thinking about that. Ex- <laughs> that, was a, that, that was a mixture of He didn't end up writing about us anyway, so no. what, it is what it was. It was an interesting chat. Because I think we sat down to talk with him and then he turned a video camera on and we were like, oh, you're videoing this now, okay. Yeah, we're going to do like a little live demo now. Yeah, I wonder whether that tape will ever see the light of day. We'll see, we get but a yeah, media leak there. As a British person who hadn't really been much in America, I didn't have a good appreciation of how diverse it is and how different the East Coast and West Coast are. And then, you know, like kind of more like provincial America, like how how culture and even um, architecture and all of those things like very place to place. So it's been pretty awesome um, you know, yeah, got, I mean, got an awesome country. Y- I like it. Yeah, no, and I would say that even for, you know, I'm I'm, I'm American and born, and raised, grew up in California, but like I think even most Americans don't see as much of America as they should. Right? Mm. I think it gives parents for all of us, not just us two, to see more parts of the country because I think yeah. it is like, okay, you go to your New Yorks, you go to your LA's. But it's always challenging as well to like if you end up somewhere and work like actually getting out and seeing the place and I think one of the things that I've enjoyed is that in all of these places that we've been you and I together and whenever I've been somewhere on work is that I often go for a running for yeah. a run so I'll get to see like one of my like personal highlights was the first time we were in DC I went for a run and went around um, Capitol Hill and like saw all, like the Lincoln statue and the pool that was in like Forrest Gump and Washington the White Monument. House yeah all of those yeah. things like I'd never been there and seen it and so actually being able to like go and like run around there and like see a lot of the sites kind of quickly <laughs> I was like kind of a cool thing and New York as well I ran around the outside uh, sort of, uh, well I ran around Central Park but then I also ran along the sort of like the seafront I don't know what the the like correct term for it would be but like around the outside of uh, okay. Manhattan Manhattan yeah. Island yeah so sort of did that a little bit as well so either probably saw New Jersey or Brooklyn yeah like actually on the on the land mass that Central Park is on I kind of like ran to the edge and then ran around the outside. So those were like cool places to run. And But then, you know, I've also been, we've been to like a trade fair in, um, Col- not Columbus, not Dayton, maybe Dayton, Indianapolis. And that's like not a very exciting place to run. Not much to see. <laughs> not much to see in like not directly outside. We're not trying there. to offend Indiana. No, I didn't no. say that. Bree said that. Blame <laughs> the British person. The, it, was, it was quieter. And I didn't spend much time in the center of town. We were at the convention center. Yeah, that was funny because we were there and it was my birthday and we were presenting at this trade fair and um, I was with Michael and Adam and they forgot that it was my birthday and we sort of like went through the day and we got to the airport in the evening. I was like, guys, you know, it's my birthday today. And they were like, oh, what? So they bought me Chick-fil-A. That was that was my birthday celebration. <laughs> like, oh, okay, well, we'll buy you something nice at the airport. It was um, the best that um, Indianapolis Airport had was Chick Fil A. It's not gourmet, good. but it's it's a it's a yummy sandwich. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that the chicken strips are better than the little bites, more crispiness. Yeah, for sure. Still agrees. Still agrees. I don't know. I've never really tried it. I like the sandwiches. Yeah, sandwiches are great, and the waffle fries. Now you gotta get rid of that bread, that carb, extra carb. <laughs> <laughs> what? was the most surprising thing about our community or launching keto nesters that you didn't expect? Because I know that obviously you worked at it on the keto ester as a research compound. Mm. Um, you know, me, uh, you know, I, you know, saw it from a research perspective and a science perspective before looking at it as a product perspective. Um, what do you, yeah, I, like, what, 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 like, what are your thoughts on the response? To be honest, I think one of the things that was surprising, and I don't know why it surprised me because I think I should have expected it, surprised me and has like frustrated me the most is like the amount of conflation between like what ketone drinks will do and what the diet will do and the amount of confusion that there is around like ketosis and drinks and fat for fuel. And like, I think that a lot of other companies out there in the space deliberately conflate it because it sells product really nicely to be like, yeah, magic weight loss, ketosis equals weight loss, ketone drinks equals ketosis, therefore ketone drinks equals weight loss. And I think that, you know, 
perhaps there's an interaction there, but we're definitely not at that stage. And in fact, you know, I think we've talked about this loads of times, like when you drink exogenous ketones in the short term, you inhibit your own lipolysis. So I kind of get interested, like if you drink a ketone drink, you slow down the like release of, let's say, belly fat. But actually what we found when we looked at the muscles of athletes when they were exercising, having had exogenous ketones was that they burn more of that like kind of... Um, intramuscular lipid so it's you have to be super nuanced like you're so you're because and fat burning isn't a nuanced enough term so you, you shut down fat release or lipolysis but you may enhance fat oxidation within the fat, muscle yeah so it's like there's a lot of nuance there and i guess like it shouldn't be surprising that 99.9 percent .9 of people miss all of the nuance but i think um the the um the amount that we had to, we have to like really spell things out really clearly. It's sort of been sort of surprising how entrenched some of the views are within the community and, and also maybe surprised at um, how like negative, some people in the keto community are like, exogenous ketones, like why would you even do that? You know, like people get kind of like defensive of, of the fact that you want to be in endogenous ketosis. And I think it's actually like, let's look at the time and the place and the context and like, um, you know, I don't think anyone's saying at this stage that ketone drinks will completely ever replace the ketogenic diet for certain use cases. But I think that the surprise was that like 95% of people who are interested in ketosis are interested in it for weight loss or metabolic health. And specifically for weight loss, you can't just like have calories from ketone ester and like not change anything else about your diet and assume that that's going to be like a magic, magic pill yeah. yeah you have to you you could use ketone ester as part of like a ramping on to keto or to support workouts when you're on keto right. or support fasting and all of that but yeah you're not like magically melting off fat by drinking ketone ester you have yeah. to like make other changes there. so i think like that like trying to articulate nuance it surprised me how how much confusion that there was and how careful we had to be and it's still something where i think that like people like us and people who are doing the research need to be like really uh, hold ourselves to a high bar of like um, language. And unfortunately, a lot of the other product companies like don't do that because it helps them to deliberately conflate things a little yeah. bit. I mean, there's much education and good work to be done on the science side. So as you ramp down into an advisory consultative role with HVMN and ramping up with a full-time role at the Buck Institute, um, what are some of the interesting scientific questions that you're looking forward to answering or help answer? So I think one of the things that's like a little bit of a hangover from my PhD is like the um, the different ways that the body could use the different isoforms of BHB. So um, in Delta G human ketone, the ketone ester in human ketone, we have pure D-beta-hydroxybutyrate. And the reason there is that we know that D-beta-hydroxybutyrate is a really great fuel for the cells of the body. It's and the so natural form that the, the body endogenously form. produces. Mm -hmm. So we always like focused our research in on, on this form uh, because we were really focused in on providing a substrate for the body. Now, in my PhD, we I was looking at um, racemic, so that means a mixture of the physiologic and the non-physiologic forms of BHB. I was looking at racemic ketone ketone salts. They were a mixture of D, which is the natural form, and L, which is the, the form that the body doesn't make, the and unnatural form. And just to add some form. context, a lot of organic compounds, things with carbon, have mm -hmm. these isoforms, these chiral forms. So L, they're like the left-handed, right-handed versions of molecules. Same yes. exact chemical compound, but they don't look the same. They don't overlay. Yeah. And that means that they interact with the body a little bit differently. So with ketones, this means specifically that the D form is really great for being used for energy um, and as an oxidative fuel. And so in my PhD, I was, um, you know, I, you know, there'd been some early work done in animals, but this is the first time that in humans, we'd looked at the rate of removal of the non-natural form from the body. And so when in my PhD, I found that if you had a drink that contained both of the forms, both went up, but then this non-natural form would like persist in the blood for a really, really long time. And so it's clearly not being used for an energy source as rapidly, you know, if as rapidly, if at all, compared with the natural form. But um, what is it doing anything in the body? And so some of the other interactions of ketones with the body may not be isoform specific. So we know that ketones bind to certain receptors or have um, activity with, for example, H HDAC. Um, so G if histone deacetylase activity affecting gene expression. And, you know, you and I have been tracking the literature and we're 
were seeing work come out. Um, there was a paper about vascular senescence and they were started to look at the difference between the D and the L form. And so there's people who are starting to do this work and seeing that um, the signaling properties of this non-natural form may be important. And so for me, um, especially going to the buck where they're very, you know, they were the first people to publish on BHB as a signal and they actually write every year, like kind of like the ketone signaling Bible and it's called beta-hydroxybutyrate as a signaling metabolite. It's like 30 pages long and it really summarizes all of the evidence around like the non-fuel uses of ketones. Yep. Um so I'm really Pretty interested. Deep read. It's a good read, though. Yeah, but it's cool because it covers all of the, you know, uh, all of the receptor interactions, all of the gene expression interactions, and all of the data that there is today. And so now we're getting to a point where there's some signal that this L non-natural form may be signaling in a way that's compa comparable. So I want to start unpicking how how that works. Uh, what that might be useful for, and if therefore that there is ultimately like a place in in the world for mixture drinks or, or products that contain like mixtures of the two. So would it be really helpful to for an athlete to be drinking human ketone? But if you want mm, longevity, do you actually want a blend of the two? And like, what's the ideal blend of the two? And you know, all of those things. So for me, um, that's an area that I'm really interested to understand specifically stemming from like my own PhD research, having been like one of the first people to look at this. And I'm really excited to see, um, to use the, the tools and the expertise that they have there to start sort of unpicking that. Um, and I think that I'm just super excited to see the, the field of exogenous ketones and that like research grow because there's so much interest and we really need to start like backing it up with good science and expanding all of that more and more good science to expand out more and more use cases and more and more nuanced understanding of like oh when do you want um like your ketones at four millimolar or when do you want your ketones at like one and when will that do and then you know all, all of these different questions like threshold effects that's another thing that i really want to start looking at that people just have never done right like what what's the level of blood ketones where you're burning as much ketone as you can or what like are the factors that um affect that so a little again in my phd i was looking at manipulating the level of stored carbohydrate or glycogen in a rat heart and I found that when the glycogen was low, the heart wasn't able to burn as much ketone, which is kind of counterintuitive because you'd think if it was out of carbohydrate that it would want to burn more ketone. Mm -hmm. But actually we were seeing that carbohydrate was sort of like permissive for ketone use. And so really trying to unpick like what's the optimum level and what are the optimum conditions for burning ketones or for ketones, you know, being used as a fuel, but then also as a signal, like at what level do you kind of reach maximum receptor activity, let's right. just say. So if you're going to, so we know that when you have a drink of human ketone, your blood levels of free fatty acids fall because the ketones are slowing down lipolysis as we kind of just discussed. But like, when does that effect become maximal? Because you actually, like with blood glucose, so ketones drop blood glucose, but glucose never goes to zero. So there's some kind of like dose response, but when is that like a kind of a, a physiological maximum? So it's important to start understanding um, so that we know how to apply ketones best and like what's the best dosing strategies. It's important to start understanding some thresholds as well. Yeah. And that's going to be completely context dependent. So for an athlete, we, you know, everything that we've seen to date really suggests that you want to be like two to four millimoles during exercise, which means that if you were at rest, your ketone like levels are actually going to be like five or six. Yeah. yeah. So um, we know that that high level is going to be important for athletic performance because the substrate role of ketones is is important there. But for the signaling stuff, maybe for you could or for recovery, for, for blood sugar suppression, all of these things yeah. are going to be a little different and and maybe maybe lower. And so actually, like looking at um, being able to develop like really good sound guidelines and, and like you know that aren't just speculative that's like you know backed by some human research and be like yeah this is this is what you need to be targeting for this effect and you know for for this uh, use case you want to take like 50 percent d and 50 percent l or 50 percent uh, sorry 100 percent d only or 100 percent l only so mixing up these two ice forms and all you know there's there's just a lot of levers to play with yeah. and so i just want to um i sort of Hope that I'll be able to sort of start scratching the surface there. I don't know how much of it one yeah. person can do. <laughs> I mean, it sounds super exciting. I know we've talked about some of these ideas over the last couple of years, just in our own discussions over at HVMN. So very excited for you to have that platform to actually start answering these very fundamental questions and how 
ketones work. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, and, I guess, and hopefully we can work together and, and, and support each other in, in a in a new context there. Yeah, and I think that one thing that I've enjoyed, you know, hugely as part of the job is the opportunity to have like this kind of conversation and you know actually speak and hopefully educate people in the space more. And I hope that you know. Um, you know, I either come back and be a guest again on the podcast or, um, you know, be involved uh, more you know, throughout my career in, in more of this like education, because I think that it's important, um, you know, all of the work that's being done here and all of the work that I've been part of that education piece is just super, super important. Yeah. So I, I hope that Absolutely. I can carry on with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I know that Zill already, you know, we've been talking about it, that while you might not be a co-host, uh, you know, moving forward, but you'll definitely be a recurring guest that will have you back any time <laughs> that, that that you'd want to update us on, on on your work or things that are interesting for our community. Yeah, I can't um, get rid of me that easily. And then I always like to ask this question towards our more science-oriented folks. Um, but if you had infinite money, and you might have touched upon this in, in, in some of the research ideas that you're excited about, but if you had one study to run, you had infinite resources, infinite power over putting people in cages if you really <laughs> wanted to, what would that look experiment look like and what would the protocol be? I think one thing that would just be like useful broadly for the world would be kind of probably, uh, you know, like a metabolic ward kind of study, but like actually comparing ketone ketone supplementation of some kind with the ketogenic diet. Mm. So um, like actually trying to work out, you know, like if, if I had like infinite money and resources and research participants that were kind of like down, it'd probably do some like muscle biopsies and probably like adipose tissue biopsy and like just really try and like put people like so Dr. Volek does a great job of like putting people on a ketogenic diet and like getting good adherence and getting like decent levels of blood ketones like pretty quickly so it'd be interesting to do I don't know you know minimum like a month say where you could maybe and maybe they wouldn't be on the ward the whole time but you'd control like diet would be controlled with both groups or you know match match for calories um you know I guess probably the people on keto nester probably have them not on a like a ketogenic diet but have them on you know our best approximation of like a healthy diet I don't necessarily think that I think necessarily there wouldn't necessarily be like an exercise component and I just really want to understand like the basic biology of like maybe say like gene expression and or resting metabolic rate and or you know markers of um like cholesterol metabolism and glucose metabolism all of those things like would getting ketone levels to one or two by diet be equivalent to getting it to one or two and keeping it one or two right. with the drink like that's just like a really interesting and yeah. and you know not not hugely technical but like actually technical enough that, and difficult enough that it's you know not, not, it. not, not easy to it. do so I think that that would be something that I'd be interested to do yeah um, the carbohydrate restriction question right like how much of the benefits of ketosis is from the yeah. ketones themselves versus the carbohydrate restriction yeah and I think I, it'll be some combination yeah. of both and I think if I had like infinite resources to influence like the the you know the broader research world out there anyone that would do a study using exogenous ketones I would have like a ketogenic diet arm included as well, just like broadly across across the board. Like any study that's looking at ketone esters for neurodegenerative diseases, I think you should also be, you know, if money was no option and participants were no uh, money and participants were no obstacle. Sorry, then I think that you'd always it would be great to have the gold standard comparison be ketone drink, ketogenic diet, and then the control condition as well, so that we could see if there was like how much of the benefit was due to the delivery of the exogenous ketones versus carbohydrate restriction. So I think um, those are all, you know, like pretty interesting. And I'd still like to, I mean, figure out, I think it's technically kind of difficult, but like some of the stuff to do with like brain health and metabolism, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And, and you know, a lot of, um, a lot of people that could be like positively affected by a better understanding of how exogenous ketones are affecting affecting the brain in not only neurodegenerative conditions but also concussion and all of that kind of thing as well. So I think those are that's an area where I'm like personally like excited to see the research research sort of develop. One hundred percent. Yeah. That's all the time that we have for now. So very much bittersweet to bid farewell at this context, but very much look forward to working with you in a new context uh, in the near future. So yeah. really an honor to have gotten to know you and work very closely with you over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think, you know, to all the listeners out there, it's like, I think what we've been trying to work on here is like making making the best products and putting out the best sort of education and really helping everyone, not only in the company, but everyone who who's like part of the 
broader HVMN community, like helping people to like self-actualize. And for me, just the way that you and everyone in the company has supported me on this like next step, it's like, as I'm trying to uh, sort of self-actualize kind of of myself. So I appreciate like, I appreciate all of the support um, that I've had over the last couple of years. And, you know, it's definitely sort of so long and not like goodbye forever. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to carry on like growing this space as, uh, you know, from a different context, but um, still very much like part of the family. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll miss you, but we'll not miss you too far, too much because you'll you'll be close. Yes, people can people can keep up on all of my antics and Ironman training and ketone experiments and all of that. So yeah, all right. Talk to you soon. We'll have you back on very shortly. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes out to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes you find most valuable. Visit go.hvmn.com slash podcast survey for that survey. It'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. Until next time, eat well, train smart, and live your life.